I'm a Christian, but I can't defend you, God. When people ask me, why a good God lets bad things happen, I just don't have a good answer. Why did you let a tornado destroy all those homes except one? Why did you let some people die and others live? Defend yourself, God, because I can't. She was only 32 and had two children. God, why did you let her die? And the list goes on and on. Two males in trench coats have shot down. If I were God, I wouldn't let all these bad things happen. Defend yourself, God. I can't. Before we get going, we'll go ahead and dismiss our children to Children's Church. If you have not already gone, uh, our ch children ages 4 to 7, uh, Children's Church upstairs. I encourage you to do that if you'd like. You're welcome to stay. Uh, the question that I want to seek to answer this morning is a question you may have heard in different ways. If God is good and God is great, why does he allow pain, suffering, in this world? That's a big question. Ultimately, I know many of you know, and I thank you for your prayers, uh, my father-in-law passed away on Monday. Uh, no advanced sickness or anything of that. I, I talked to him Saturday night. He ended up having a major stroke on Sunday morning somewhere. Uh, it would have been technically Sunday night, Monday morning. Uh, but somewhere between Sunday night and Monday morning, had a massive stroke and ended up dying in the hospital Monday night. Uh, no warning, but a very big reminder that suffering is real. This earth has big problems in it. I was planning to preach on this subject matter long before I knew Dad Craft would die because it's not just about me and my family, what we go through. As I look around this room, I know many of you have been touched with tragedy. No doubt some of you are dealing with difficulty that I don't know anything about. It can be very, very hard when we're in the midst of pain and suffering and we stop and ask God, why does all this happen? The Bible has answers. And if we're looking to the cause of pain and suffering, we can go back to the beginning. As we are looking in the beginning, the book of Genesis, we see where there is the beginning of pain and suffering. And we're going to learn a couple reasons why there is pain and suffering in our world today. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, you see what some people would think to be another creation account. In Genesis 1, 1 to Genesis 2, 3, we see God creating the heavens and earth in six days. Then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about God creating man and woman. It's not a separate creation account. It's just focusing on the sixth day. If you will, it was like going through the, the forest, if you will, and looking at the totality of creation and then coming to the crown of God's creation, looking specifically at mankind. And that's where Genesis 2-4 begins. The primarily what we're going to be looking at is Genesis chapter 3 this morning, which is really talking about the fall of mankind. Uh, so if you have your copy of God's Word nearby and as you're able, would you stand with me? as a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's holy written and errant word. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, Neither shall you touch it, touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing 
good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Would you pray with me? Father, no doubt uh, there are some here going through difficulty. There are some that may be watching that are really having a, a hard time. Lord, I, I know that you have good reasons for allowing these things in our lives that we may not always understand. But Father, I pray that we would see that there is good reasons why there is pain and suffering in this world. Certainly of no account of you, but on account of us. So Father, I pray that you give us wisdom and understanding as we seek to understand this important answer to an often asked question. This we ask in Jesus' name. God's people said. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Inside your bulletin, or if you've got the application on your phone or device, you'll see an opportunity to jot some notes down. Uh, but as we see from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, it's important to notice that at the end of the six days of creation, if you look back to Genesis 1.31, in Genesis chapter 1, 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And so after everything was created, God looked at it and said, you know what? It's all good. Now, was there death? Was there pain and suffering? No. No. So one of the things we have to realize when we're talking about the reason for pain and suffering, we have to realize that God's original creation did not include it. You can write that down as your main idea for you this morning. Across the top of your page or on top of your application, God's original creation did not include suffering. Where did it come from then? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Ultimately, we see that God made everything perfect. In this perfection, this garden of great riches, God simply gave one rule. Everything's yours. But this one tree, don't eat this tree. Now, ultimately, what this teaches us is that God gave mankind, men and women, an incredible gift a power of something that they could use to help people or to hurt people. What was that power? Simply choice. Free will. I wrote that down for point number one. When we come to the reason for pain and suffering, the first thing we have to remember is God has granted us the power of choice. There's a significant big picture here of all the things in the world, all the problems in the world, and a lot of those problems coming back to simply our own choices. Think of it this way. How much pain and suffering would be in the world if we didn't have the opportunity to choose the wrong decisions? Now, ultimately... Uh, the reality is God loved us as the crown of, our cre of his creation. He, he looked at us and he gave us free will. With this, some would say, well, man, if God gave us the opportunity to sin through being free, is he not the author of sin? God created us free, which means, yes, we could have chosen good or we could have chosen bad. And we all have that same free will that we exercise each and every day. Ultimately, God knew that all of creation would fall because of free will. But if he thought us having it 
was valuable enough to even risk all of that. We've got to trust him for that. Because can you imagine a world without free will? Can you imagine a world where we could have any real joy and happiness without the freedom and the power of choice? Now, ultimately, what we do realize is because God gives us freedom of choice, that means he will allow us to make bad decisions. He will not violate our freedom when we're about to make a bad decision, but he will allow us to make bad decisions. I wrote this down for letter A in your notes under point number one. God will let me make bad decisions. Anybody want want to confess making one recently? All right, I will. Uh, Friday, I was coming back from Richmond, and uh, my my father-in-law's memorial, and I was driving back, uh, coming back on 64 East, uh, right outside of Richmond, and for some reason, my GPS decided to take me on 60 East instead of just continuing on 64 East. Does anybody go that way? Okay, some people do. I've never been that way, but, you know, I don't know what your GPS is like, but if if I don't listen to my GPS, she gets kind of (laughs) testy. So I went the way she said, and sure enough, we're on this little back road, and I didn't know where we were, and I was coming through the small town of Lenexa, Virginia. Nobody, okay. Okay, you know Lenexa, all right. And I'm saying, well, this is a nice spot. I'll just stop and I'll let my dogs out because they look like they were ready to go out, you know. And I I took my dogs with me, as you can imagine. I mean, it was just, it was a beautiful day. The temperature was all right. So I just went out and came back and I figured I'd take them. And so I stopped in this parking lot and I got Phoebe out. I took her over the grass, let her drink some water and take care of some things in the grass. Turned around in the truck to get Sandy out, my wife's dog. It's not, that's not my dog. My dog's Phoebe. Uh, my wife and daughters have joint ownership in this other dog, Sandy. And Sandy was so excited that I was heading back to the truck. She starts jumping up and down, and she hits the lock button on the truck. The keys were in it because, obviously, I left it running. And I reached in my pocket. My cell phone was in it as well. I'm looking at this little white dog, and she's barking at me because she doesn't understand why I won't open the door. And I look down at Phoebe, and Phoebe is looking at me with this look like, well, you're the one that brought her. (laughs) And right there, you're saying, well, that was your own bad decision. And I agree, that was a bad decision. But, you know, I've had my dog for years, and uh, almost two years now, and uh, I leave her in the truck all the time. She's never locked me out. One time with my wife's dog, in 30 seconds alone, she decides to lock me out. So there was a small grocery, a Stewart's Grocery, I think as it's called. It's a small building right there on Route 60. So I walk in, and I, I see the lady there. I found her name was Kim. I said, do you have a Slim Jim by chance? She said, of course. <laughs> Pointed to behind the counter to the beef sticks. And I, I said, no, ma'am, I don't think you understand. I... My dog locked me out of my truck, and uh, she said, oh, I've got it. She goes back, comes back. She brings out a little milk bone biscuit. (laughs) She says, here, try to get her to do it again. I'm looking at the lady. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing myself on the side of the road, tapping this biscuit against the glass, trying to get this little white dog to hit the button again. And then she says... That's what helped the last lady. And I'm immediately thinking, I'm not the only idiot that drives through Lenexa. That's, that's comforting. But she could tell by the look on my face that this wasn't an idea that I was really sold on. So then she says, I'll call my grandson. All right. She calls her grandson. Two, three minutes. He just lived down the road, she said. Came down. And he pulls up and he says, hey, Ma or Grandma, what's, what's the problem? And she explained and he laughed and... He got into the back of his trunk of his car and pulled out a full three-piece lockout kit. I mean, you know, the wedge, the little blood pressure cuff thing, the whole pole and everything. Two minutes, and it was open, like nothing. 
I didn't ask the guy why he had a full lockout kit in the back of his trunk. <laughs> I shook his hand, I gave him $20, and I said, thank you very, very much. Now here's the point. After that decision, I could have either looked up to God and said, God, why would you, being so good, allow me to experience this terrible inconvenience? To which God would have said, duh. <laughs> or I could have, as I did, thank God I had a great illustration for $20. <laughs> it was, I thought it was a good deal. But God will let you make bad decisions. And in fact, God knows and he doesn't want you to make bad decisions. He doesn't encourage you to make them. He doesn't even tempt you with bad decisions. We do that all on our own. And with that, that's where a lot of the pain comes from. With our own free will, we end up hurting people. And people hurt you by their own choice. Ultimately, I had a coworker when I was working at Applebee's in Indiana. And he found out I was Christian. And he said to me, he said, I don't know how you can believe in a God that allows such bad things to happen. And I, I, I kind of got the idea he was talking about something specific because there wasn't like something recent on the news or anything like that that I knew of. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, when I was a very young child, my father killed my wife and shot himself. Why did God let that happen? And I told him, as I'm telling you, God gives us free choice. Sometimes with that choice, we do terrible things. He's not happy about it. But he loved all of us enough to say, here, you have the power of choice. Now, he hearing this, he said, not necessarily any closer to becoming Christian, but said, at least you didn't say God works in mysterious ways. I guess that's what he's heard many times. But the truth is, how many people are lining up to God and say, God, you just take away my freedom to choose. That way I don't hurt anybody. Even if you don't say, okay, don't, don't take away my freedom to choose, but how about I do it your way so I don't hurt anybody? But yet we look to God and we say, God, why didn't you stop that from happening? Why didn't you violate that person's free will? God doesn't do that much. There are instances where you see God intervening and in, in stopping one person from making a bad decision, but you know what you see more often than that? You simply see that God is in control. There is this felt tension, mind you, that we understand God is in control, but we are all free to choose. You can write this down about God's sovereignty under letter B in your notes. God is completely sovereign. God is completely sovereign. Sovereign meaning he is the authority. He is in control. And, and you're going to say, well, how is God in control and we are free? That's debated by a lot of different scholars about trying to ease the tension between God being in absolute control and our absolute freedom. Uh, and, and I'm not really going to take a lot of time to, to go into this debated topic. You know, this is seen most often when people are talking about salvation, freedom to choose salvation, and, and God leading us to salvation. And ultimately, what I just will say is this. God is in control, and you are free. How it often works many times, God will not necessarily violate someone's free will but in his sovereignty, he will not eliminate the decision, but he will mitigate, if not eliminate, the damage from it. Think, for instance, if you had a king and this king thought it would be a good idea to throw a man named Daniel in a den of lions, would God stop him from making that decision? No. What did he do? He allowed Nebuchadnezzar or ultimately, 
He, he allowed the king. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. I wrote it down. Yeah, it was. No, Darius. Sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, the three guys in the fiery furnace. Darius ultimately threw Daniel in a den of lions, exercising his free will, right? What did God do? Eliminated the damage from that decision by closing the lion's mouth. And Nebuchadnezzar, as I was also thinking about, the three guys thrown in the fiery furnace, did God violate Nebuchadnezzar's free will? But he still showed his sovereignty. Now, ultimately, you hear people talking about this where someone pulled a gun on them, squeezed the trigger, and yet it didn't go off. You know, we see at times where we see God is still sovereign. People saying, you know, I should have been dead from that dumb decision I made, but I wasn't. And I'm not. Now, it is uh, many times people look and say, well, God doesn't always do that. And no, he doesn't. God doesn't always eliminate the damage from our bad decisions. And the question we ask is why? There are reasons, we know. We're actually going to look in our life groups this week about reminding you of some of the reasons God has for allowing suffering. Um, and, and there are many. We'll look at that again. I don't want to take the time to do that right this minute. But God has reasons why he allows it. But the overarching idea that I want you to see is the main reason is that he loved us enough to give us free will. With that free power of choice, we oftentimes choose to hurt each other. God is still sovereign, but doesn't mean he's always going to intervene. Now, some would say, well, pastor, you know, all these problems that I see are not always by a product of choice. At least not the person's choice. Most people wouldn't choose to go into a natural disaster. There's that little guy drives in a car that follows storms around or something. But other than a guy like that, most people don't choose to be in a natural disaster. A person, uh, short of being out of their right mind, don't often choose death. So, what is an explanation if we remove even a person's free choice? We would still see death and a lot of devastation. Well, there is another reason. And we can see that not from our choice, but as we look to Adam and Eve's original choice. Because what God told Adam and what Eve also knew is that if they broke the one rule, there was going to be consequence. I wrote this down for point number two. God gave us the promise of consequence. God gave us the promise of consequence. Now when I say that, most of us know simply of the simple consequences again that come with bad decisions. You leave your wife's dog in the car with the keys in it. There's going to be a negative consequence, perhaps. And that's not really what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, the Bible does talk about we reap what we sow. But ultimately what I'm talking about are lasting consequences from Adam and Eve's original sin. Ultimately, the Bible tells us that there are two main consequences from that original sin that still today impact us with pain and suffering. Now, ultimately, as you see in your notes, in Genesis, he's specifically referring to what would happen in Genesis chapter 2, and then in Genesis chapter 3, they do it, and it does happen. What is the, the main consequence God says to Adam? If you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Surely die. I wrote this down in your notes. Sin brought death to humanity. The original sin introduced death. That means every memorial service, every funeral, every loss of loved one can be traced back to the original sin. Because that wasn't part of God's original creation. Amen. Now ultimately, in some translation it would say, in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die on the day which they ate? 
Yes, spiritually speaking, certainly. Death, we know, is separation. Uh, Death, physically, is a separation from the soul, from the body. Death, spiritually, is a separation of the soul from God. And there was, at that moment, immediate spiritual death. You can write that down in your notes. Spiritual death was immediate. In Isaiah, the Bible says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. The reality that in that day, they were brought down and separated from God. Separation that still continues today. All of us choose sin for all of sin. And we are separated from God, going all the way back. Now, ultimately, did physical death come? Yes. And it is interesting to note, a lot of times when the Bible, I say a lot of times, a few times when the Bible says, and on that day, it's not talking about immediacy as much as it's talking about certainty. So there are times in Scripture where uh, the author will say, and on that day, talking about the certainty of some event. So it could have been he was just talking about physical death, but saying, on that day, it will now become certain. And has physical death become certain? Yes, you can write that down as well. Physical death became certain. Physical death became certain because of the fall. It is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, Hebrews 9. Ultimately, you see in this passage that because of sin... Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden. Take a look, if you will, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 and following. The Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Now, was God saying, Hey, I'm I'm afraid of what this guy has become? Why would God say, okay, you've now allowed sin to enter the picture, but now I want to make sure you don't live forever? Living forever wasn't a problem. That was God's original plan. And subsequently, we will live forever because of God's new plan. The problem was living forever in sin. He said, now that man is sinful and I can have nothing to do with him, I want to make sure he doesn't live in this life forever, but that there will be a new life. And that's ultimately what he's talking about, is that uh, God, did in, his, in his love, did not want man to continue living permanently in sin. And that's where death came, certainly. Now, we also know that there was a second consequence, lasting consequence, because of the original sin. It was not just death. We see this uh, again in this passage that we're looking at, specifically talking about uh, those things that take place because of what took place of sin. Look at Genesis 3, 17. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree which I commanded, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So what was the second lasting consequence? I wrote it down this way for letter B. Sin brought devastation to the earth. You see, man, Adam and Eve, were given dominion over the earth. And when they allowed sin into their lives, it then impacted all of the earth. God then, because of the sin allowed devastation to be part of this earth. You know, he's already promised death. And by death, we're not just talking about physical death, but spiritual death. And by death, we're not just talking about the moment of death. We're now talking about pain and suffering. And some of you deal with chronic pain as a constant reminder that our physical bodies are not lasting like they should. 
that all of the disease, all of the things that are associated with our physical bodies come back to the idea that we are no longer in God's original creation. Then the earth is now changed. He talks about thorns and thistles. He talks about weeds coming up. So there's a change. Natural disasters. You look at something, you see this natural disaster. That is a reminder that the earth has been changed. That wasn't part of original creation. And that was a direct byproduct of a lasting consequence because of the choice of sin. Now, ultimately, regardless of what we're talking about, we're looking back at Adam and Eve and we're easily pointing the blame at them. Whether death or devastation, we say, hey, that's what they did. And that's easy to do. But let me ask you, how are you doing? When's the last time you disobeyed God? When's the last time he said, don't do that? And you did it. I don't know how long you would have lasted in the Garden of Eden without sin. Maybe it was a while. Maybe it would have been a while. But I know we all fall short. Unless we get too excited at pointing the finger of blame at Adam and Eve, we must examine ourselves. Now, still the question is, God allowed this to happen. He gave us the power of choice. And he gave us the promise of consequence. Let's review. The main idea I wanted you to get from this is God's original creation did not include suffering. So where did suffering come from? Two things we learn from this text. God has granted us the power of choice. We have free will. Letter A, God will let me make bad decisions. With these bad decisions, we hurt ourselves and we hurt those around us. But, good news, God is still completely sovereign. And thankfully, many of the bad decisions we make don't damage as much as they could. Second reason is God gave us a promise of consequence. Lasting consequence traced back all to the original sin. With that, sin brought death to humanity. Spiritual death was immediate and physical death became certain. Secondly, sin brought devastation to the earth. So here's a picture of what happened. Now the question, why didn't God do something about it? Yeah. He did. That's the good news. You know, again, we can get sidetracked. We can think of the problem as being pain and suffering, death and dying. But, you know, that's not the problem. What is the problem? Sin is the problem. Death, pain and suffering, those are symptoms of the problem. The problem is sin. A willful, uh, a willful decision to walk away from the plan of God. The, the sin that we allow, this is the problem. So what did God do? I mean, think about it. If you went to a physician and you told them about a problem in your life, would you want them just to treat the symptoms of the problem? Or would you want them to deal with the problem itself? God, being the great physician, did not deal with just the symptoms. But he dealt with the problem. And the problem, loved ones, is sin. And that's what he sent Jesus to take care of. I wrote it down this way in my notes for the first concluding point. Jesus came to save us from sin. That's the good news. Although we messed up, not just Adam and Eve, but all of us, Jesus came to deal with the problem. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, specifically, He came, and for our sake, God made Him sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So sin, the problem, was dealt with. And then the, the, the next question, well, if the sin has been paid for, why is there still suffering? And, and let me say, just because Jesus died for the sin of the world, 
doesn't mean everyone automatically accepts that gift of salvation. Ultimately, there's still free will. God is not going to force anyone to receive Jesus. He's not going to say, okay, if, if you don't receive Christ, you're going to go to hell, so you've got to do it, and right now you've got to get saved. He's not going to make that happen. He's not going to force it to happen. He gives us a choice. And because God is patient, he is waiting for some people to make that choice. Uh, the Bible says it this way in 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But there is coming a day when God's going to say, enough. Jesus will return. And then he will deal with the symptom of the problem. And I wrote it down this way. Jesus will save us from suffering. The Bible gives us a picture of that in Revelation. Revelation 21, the Bible says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. A new heaven and a new earth, free from pain and suffering, without death or dying. That's the good news. Now, there's two things you can take away from this. The first, some of you might be living your life your own way, which would include some bad decisions, no doubt. And you might now be experiencing some of the immediate consequences of some of those decisions. Maybe this is a time where you realize God knows best. And that you would release some of the choices that you're making over your life and give that choice to God and say, God, what do you want from me? How can I live my life differently? Now, that might be something, a choice you need to make. Some of you maybe have never received Jesus Christ, and today would be a time where you say, you know what, I need Jesus in my life. Some of you might be followers of Christ, but for whatever reason, you haven't been following him very closely. Now, secondly, there are people, you are here, and you are a follower of Christ, and you are passionate about it, but still, you are suffering. God's still in control. And you can hold on to that. Although he allows some terrible things to happen that we may not fully understand, he is still in control. And this is not the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And we praise you for loving us enough to give us free will. And Lord, although we use it to hurt ourselves and to hurt those around us, that you still loved us enough to send your son to deal with the problem. And I thank you for Jesus dying for us. And Lord, although this life is still filled with pain and suffering, as you're waiting for some people to, to make that decision, Lord, I pray that even now, Jesus would return soon. We're looking forward to the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth, free from pain and suffering. And Lord, even now for those who are here, who are hurting, I pray that you'd comfort them. May we remind it, may we be reminded that you are still in control. Father, this we ask in Jesus' name. And amen.